Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today we're continuing on with Matt Powell's The Atheist Religion video. Going by the title, you'd think that the goal of this video is to convince people that atheism is religion, but so far it's just been him and his NIFB buddies laughing at their pitiful misunderstanding of evolution. Now we are entering the section of the video titled Creation vs. Evolution. Not sure why that needs its own section since that's basically all that this has been so far, but let's see where he takes it. Free thought compares both sides of an equation. Evolution is the only theory protected by law. It's not so much that it is protected by law, rather it's the only theory that has been legally challenged and so the courts were asked to make a ruling on it. You don't have laws pertaining to the teaching of gravity because nobody objects to the teaching of gravity, except some branches of flat earthers, but they don't have enough influence at the moment to warrant any legal action to protect legitimate science from them. Really, the legal protection amounts to we teach science that is understood to be accurate in science class. Creationism is not understood to be accurate, so we do not teach it. Which means that you're actually not allowed to free think outside of evolution. Apply that statement to any other scientific theory and then ask yourself if you would want your kids going to a school with that attitude towards science. I want my kids to go to a school where they teach both sides of the gravity debate so they can free think outside of gravity. After all, gravity is only a theory. It's less well understood than evolution and plenty of people question evolution. When it comes to science, school is for learning science as it is currently understood. The free thinking part comes in at the higher levels of education where you are expected to make new discoveries and come up with new ideas. But it's hard to make new discoveries and come up with new ideas unless you first understand the current discoveries and ideas, which is what elementary and high school are supposed to teach. If you have to have laws to protect your scientific theory from scrutiny, what does that tell you about your theory? Nothing. But if you have to have laws to protect a scientific theory that is better understood than the theory of gravity, while well, you don't have to have laws protecting the theory of gravity, then what does that tell you about the people who oppose that scientific theory? Are you really allowed to be a free thinker? Yes. Now this is actually anti-education, because to have a good educational technique, to have critical thinking, you have to teach both sides of the issue. When there are two sides to an issue, yes. Evolution is a settled question though, scientifically speaking, so there is only one side. Are you suggesting that it would be good education to entertain a student's objections if they showed up to a physics class refusing to accept that acceleration is equal to delta V over T? I'm sorry, but entertaining unscientific ideas in a science classroom is not a good education. Actually scratch that, I'm not sorry and allow the student to decide for themselves which one they will believe. In a religion class, sure. In science, when scientific topics are understood to be accurate, you teach the students the accurate science. Anything less is a bad education. What we cannot do in a lab is we cannot create life. We've, we've tried every possible method, and we can't do it with all of the most high-tech instruments in the world. Do you guys remember back in Science Falsely So-Called when Matt demonstrated a perfect example of a goalpost shift with this very question? And in fact, they've never created life. So let me ask you this. So you're saying scientifically we've never created life? Well, even if we did create life, wouldn't that mean there was an intelligence behind it? There have been several instances of artificial life being created in a lab, at least one of which was done with man-made nucleotide bases, that is, base pairs in the DNA of the cell that are not found in nature. When the raging atheist seemed about to point that out to you in Science Falsely So-Called, you immediately moved the goalpost to ask the question, ah, but doesn't us creating it mean it was intelligently designed? But that takes the air out of your whole point. You have mentioned several times that the origin of life must have been so simple and yet humans can't do it. Well, we have done it. We haven't done it in a way that demonstrates abiogenesis yet, but we have created life in a lab. The trouble with abiogenesis is not that we can't figure out the mechanisms behind how basic life works. The trouble comes in when trying to figure out what the environment of the early Earth would be, what chemicals would be available, how they would interact with each other, etc. In other words, not knowing how it happened in nature does not necessarily mean that we don't know how to do it ourselves. But now we have Matt 
two years later, saying almost the exact same thing to Ethan as he said to the Raging Atheist, all without appearing to have even looked into the matter any more than he had the first time, despite getting pushback the first time. So you think that what couldn't come alive in a laboratory could, under controlled environment, could come to life in a violent prehistoric environment? Saying it's not possible right now doesn't mean it's not possible. So you're and putting your right. trust in something we have not yet discovered. I can't speak for Ethan on this one, but for me, it's not about putting trust in something that we haven't discovered. It's about not putting trust in wild speculation about supernatural events for which there is no evidence. Life began at some point, we both agree on that. But where you, Matt, are saying that we don't quite know how it happened exactly, therefore it must have been magic, I am saying that we know that life is basically, when you break it down, a series of chemical reactions. So there's no reason to think that the origin of life wasn't also a series of chemical reactions. We see life getting simpler the farther back in time you go. Abiogenesis is a reasonable extrapolation of that pattern. Magic is not. I'm just not... I I'm not putting my trust in the theistic explanation. Yeah, I'm not going to believe in your claims of magic without evidence. So until you show me some evidence of your magic claims, I will accept the scientific explanation as it is currently understood. That is the reasonable position to hold. Really, as you use cause and effect reasoning, starting with humans and argue back where did humans come from and where did life come from, Ultimately, they do believe that minerals, by some random chance process, probably in water, uh, came together to form life. Wow. Wow, Grady. Just wow. I have no other word for it than that. This, this is a stretch. This is really, really stretching hard to try and make the line, evolutionists believe we came from rocks, true. But it is not true. The closest you can come to saying that it is true is that iron, a mineral, was probably involved in the reaction that turned hydrogen cyanide into simple sugars that would have continued reacting to form simple organic compounds. So yes, minerals were involved in the reactions, but the first life was not made of minerals. So no, by no means could you say that we came from a rock. The first life made use of minerals in chemical reactions, probably in ways similar to our bodies today. So if you can call this first life a rock, then you can call us rocks, because minerals like iron are entirely necessary for our biological processes today. Now, there's a big contradiction to that, because water destroys biological uh, molecules. Uh, the, the big contradiction is that also oxygen, if molecules are trying to form in the presence of oxygen or in the presence of water, then they are destroyed faster than they could be made. Right. That is one of the problems. Which is why ponds or lakes near volcanoes are one of the suggested places where life was most likely to start. As water evaporated and the rain brought it back, the compounds could concentrate. As to the oxygen, free atmospheric oxygen is a byproduct of life. There wouldn't have been much, if any, of it around to cause problems for the first organisms. It was actually probably the increase of oxygen in the atmosphere as a waste product that caused the first mass extinction event, as oxygen would have been toxic to most life on the early Earth. Life cannot come from non-life. That's a law of science. It's the law of biogenesis that life cannot spontaneously create itself. Nope. Biogenesis is not a scientific law. This has been a creationist talking point since pretty much immediately after Pasteur published his experiment that showed that boiled broth won't spoil if you isolate it from organisms that make it spoil. Creationists unreasonably extrapolate this to say that life could never ever come from non-life, despite no such thing having ever been demonstrated. And I still have yet to hear a creationist accurately describe Pasteur's experiment, because if you actually look into it, it becomes painfully obvious that it didn't even come close to attempting to address the point that you were trying to claim that it addressed. And so according to evolution, or according to atheism, life would have had to come about in the water, DNA. Well, RNA probably came before DNA, but according to creationism, life would have had to come about when God breathed on some dirt. Chemical reactions that we know are possible happened on the early Earth seems like a better explanation than God breathing on dirt. Again, oxygen and water destroy things like DNA molecules. The whole idea of evolutionary thinking is simply falls apart when you take a look at it and look deeply. Which is why I'm sure you'd never find a Christian with scientific credentials studying such obvious nonsense when they have God as the perfect explanation, right? 
So Dr. Paul Rimmer of Cambridge University must not exist since he is a Christian who designed an apparatus called StarLab at the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology, whose purpose is to simulate plausible early Earth surface environments with the goal of increasing our understanding of the origin of life. The first sentence in his biography is that he is primarily exploring prebiotic chemistry proceeding from hydrogen cyanide and other feedback molecules at high concentrations in surface environments. Here he is talking about how methodological naturalism fits into his worldview. There's this philosophical idea of teleology, of there being some sort of telos or end or goal. And I could see there being a sense in which philosophically God provides that sort of thing. But that sort of thing really isn't accessible to that kind of methodological naturalism. That's, that's not something that you could empirically see. So you can have a complete empirical explanation, but you can still look to God for the sort of uh, deeper meaning or purpose behind why things unfolded the way that they did. I'm just going to go ahead and assume that this highly qualified origin of life researcher understands the chemistry better than both myself and Grady McMurtry here, whose secular studies stopped at a degree that was related to forestry management. It's the exact opposite of what evolution needs. So we're seeing the opposite of what they say happens. What are we supposed to believe? Fairy tale pseudoscience or what we actually observationally see? So just to be clear, you are currently calling origin of life experiments that have shown that the chemicals that make up life can be formed in plausible prebiotic earth conditions, fairy tale pseudoscience. And you're calling the idea that God made a man sculpture out of dirt, breathed on it to bring it to life, and then ripped a rib out of him to build a woman out of what we actually observationally see. The projection is strong with this one. I mean, I'm going to go with what I see. That's why I was an evolutionist and now I believe in creation. So the guy who was once convinced that he could live off of nothing but air and mystical energy now believes in young earth creation. Color me shocked. Genetics is where the war against evolution is actually won, and it's won with genetic entropy. So genetics, the science where we can literally map out our evolutionary relationships using multiple different independent methods, is the place where the war against evolution is won. Using an idea that is not very well accepted, one could argue that it is almost universally panned by geneticists. Well done? Genetic entropy is one of the single strongest modern scientific arguments against evolution. And given how weak it is, and the fact that most geneticists disagree that it's even a thing, the fact that you think it is one of the stronger lines of evidence is quite telling. Because in genetic entropy, which is really the second law of thermodynamics as applied to genetics, as you copy information, you will inevitably destroy it, lose it, corrupt it. Errors are introduced during copying, yes, but an error does not necessarily destroy or corrupt information. But you know what? By all means, continue to promote that idea. Then my argument that the Bible is corrupted because of the simple spelling mistakes and copy errors of the scribes becomes much stronger than it actually is. So either you are wrong and genetic entropy isn't a thing, or you are right and the Bible is unreliable and corrupt. That's exactly what occurs in genetics. When you copy previously existing information, you have only two choices. You can either copy it perfectly or imperfectly. And so what happens is over time, genetic information is lost. It is not gained. How are you quantifying information here? You do realize that mutations are reversible, right? It is functionally impossible for a copying error to always be a loss of information. If I write the sentence, Steve Anderson kicked Matt Powell's balls, and then someone copied it out but misread my handwriting and so wrote the sentence with one letter difference, Steve Anderson licked Matt Powell's balls, is this a gain of information or a loss of information? Well, you could say that it's a loss of information because the original intention of the sentence was lost, but genetics don't have intentions, so that doesn't really apply here. It is different information, certainly, but how do you quantify it? And then if a third person copies it out again and misreads it again, thereby changing it back to Steve Anderson kicked Matt Powell's balls, did this decrease the information again? This happens in genetics. A mutation in one generation can be reversed in the next. But if a mutation is always a loss of information, then that means that the mutation back to what it was originally is another loss of information. And that just doesn't make any sense. So either mutations can introduce new information or they are not reversible. Since they are reversible, then that means they can introduce new information. We're seeing that mutations are causing cancer and disease and 
degradation going on inside the human body. It's the exact opposite of what evolution needs. Yeah, those are called detrimental mutations. There are also neutral mutations, which do nothing and make up the vast majority of mutations, and beneficial mutations, which impart some sort of survival advantage, such as the ability to digest lactose into adulthood. That's a mutation. ApoA1 Milano is a mutation, which has a protective effect in its population from heart disease. Or the LRP5 mutation that gives higher bone density and protects against broken bones and osteoporosis. Today, because of the Human Genome Project completed in April of 2003, we know that we're losing 1-2% to 2 of our genetic information as human beings per generation. I'm sorry, what? We're losing 1-2% to 2 of our genetic information per generation? How'd you figure that? What is your source for that? I did find an article on a tech website that points out that humans appear to have less overall genetic material than Denisovans, and they in turn had less genetic material than modern chimpanzees have, which would suggest that humans are trending downward in overall amount of genetic material, but it doesn't say how much, if any, is lost per generation, it in no way suggests that this is some irreversible process for all organisms, and it relies on comparisons with our evolutionary relatives in order to make that conclusion. So if evolution is not true, then neither is this information. But that's the only thing I could find even hinting at us losing genetic information over time. And is this 1-2% to number specific to humans? Because humans have a mutation rate that is about twice as fast per generation as fruit flies, but fruit flies have a much shorter generation time, which can be anywhere from 7 to 19 days. So if they lose 0.5% of their genetic information every generation, then that would mean, conservatively speaking, that they would have less than 1% of their original genetic information left in their genome after less than three years. You'd think all of the experiments that have been done on fruit flies that have lasted longer than three years would have noticed such a drastic and significant drop in genetic information. One wonders how fruit flies have even survived long enough for us to experiment on them. And if the rate is not the same in each species, then one is left wondering, are there some factors that maybe come into play that can mitigate the effects of so-called genetic entropy? Are you taking these factors into account when discussing the human genome? My guess, based on the general low quality of the research in this video so far, is no. Now we are the approximately 250th generation since creation, roughly 6,000 years ago. The truth is, we shouldn't even be here. The amount of information that's being lost should, in fact, have caused us to become extinct. In other words, according to both your math and my math, your model doesn't work. So rather than conclude that your model is flawed, it must be God magically making it work. You either have to believe that somebody created the universe, which is consistent with the laws of thermodynamics. Sorry, but how is God consistent with thermodynamics? A being that doesn't have any energy input somehow has access to an infinite amount of energy which he can use to do whatever he wants? I mean, unless you are claiming that God has an energy source that is greater than or equal to his energy needs, but then where did that energy source come from? If you want God to make sense from a thermodynamics perspective, then you're left with an infinite regress. Or that matter and energy created itself from nothing, and that it poofed into existence magically. That's a false dichotomy. There's also the idea that space-time would have broken down before the Big Bang, leaving a time with space but no time, <laughs> see what I did there, making the concepts of both beginning and eternity kind of nonsensical until time first began. There's also the bouncing cosmology idea, which has a potentially infinite number of universes existing in sequence. There's also the idea that nothing is unstable, and it actually takes energy to keep nothing in a stable state of nothingness, so thermodynamics at that point would dictate that a universe would then come into existence. Magic need never enter the equation. And so, atheists will often accuse Christians of believing in magic. Magic. Noun. The power of apparently influencing the course of events by using mysterious or supernatural forces. Creationism, by definition, is a belief in magic. Unless you would suggest that you either understand the mechanisms that God used to create, thereby removing them from the mysterious category, or if you no longer claim that God is supernatural. I doubt you're willing to abandon the supernatural claim, so you're left with finding the mechanism that God used to create the universe. Yeah, you can say he spoke it into existence, but until you figure out exactly how sound waves propagating through the medium that was apparently there before the universe existed caused the universe to come into existence, it's mysterious. It's magic, by definition. But here's the thing. 
Anybody that believes that matter and energy could create itself believes in magic by default. That is a magic act. Good thing that's not what I believe. What do I believe? I believe that we don't know and are currently working to increase our understanding in that area. Is withholding certainty on a position until there is enough evidence to warrant a conclusion a belief in magic by default, Matt? Do you think like an explosion out of chaos produced order? I, I don't know. I do not think that. The Big Bang was not an explosion for one. Do you believe in the Big Bang? Yeah. That's as far as I've uh, uh, understood it, yes. That's an explosion out of chaos. What chaos, Matt? Are you calling the singularity chaos? I've never heard it described that way before. I mean, the Bible definitely refers to chaos at the beginning. So, Matt, if you accept the Bible, then you believe that everything came out of chaos. But that's not how the Big Bang works. Let's grant your argument that somehow nothing could create everything. That wasn't his argument, Matt. That was your misrepresentation of a scientific position, which, when asked about how it worked, Ethan's response was, I don't know. You can't take I don't know and turn it into, well, actually, this is what you believe. I don't know just means I don't know. So the second law of thermodynamics is an excellent argument proving that evolution is not true. No, it's mostly just an argument that proves that creationists don't understand the laws of thermodynamics. It proves that you start with the complex and end up with simple. It's exactly opposite to what evolutionary theory, or as I put it, evolutionary religion says. Nope. The second law of thermodynamics, at its most basic, says that heat transfers from hot things to cold things until eventually everything will be the same temperature. I'm not sure if you noticed this, but there's a really big hot thing in the sky that transfers a lot of heat energy to the cold thing that is the rock that we live on. Okay, this segment actually goes on for quite a bit longer, so I'm going to leave it here for now. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Forrest Pfeiffer and Zachary Giannieri, who both commented on Matt Powell apparently commenting on my last segment in this series, challenging me to a debate before deleting it. Well, Matt, if you're still up to it, I'm not going to do a structured debate because I hate structured debates. I don't think they're very productive for anyone, but you're welcome to join me on my channel for a conversation. But I'm guessing that he doesn't want to or he wouldn't have deleted his comment. Thanks for watching. Special thanks as always to my patrons, Lynn Dobbs, Mark McManus, What Jesus, and all the rest, who are the minerals that assist with the chemical reactions in the body that is my channel. If you'd like my channel to be a literal rock by creationist definitions, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. If you feel so inclined, you can also support the channel through direct donation or my Amazon wish list, which are linked in the description. If you'd like to listen to my videos in podcast form, the link for that is also in the description, as well as links to my social media accounts and my PO Box address. See you next time.